Last time we were together, uh, we were looking at 1 Samuel chapter 19, and uh, there we saw paranoid King Saul once again giving in to a demonically spawned rage, and again he tries to murder David. He attacks him with a spear. And then when David evades this unprovoked assault and escapes into the night, King Saul sends assassins after him to David's house uh, to, to try to ambush him and kill him. And we looked at all of that, mostly focusing uh, upon Saul, upon his knuckleheaded rebellion against God and God's rather interesting uh, uh, method of countering Saul's mutiny. Well, this morning we're going to revisit this same episode of Israel's history, uh, but this time we're going to do so through the text that we find in Psalm 59. Psalm 59. Uh, there our focus is going to be on David, uh, upon what this experience was like for him, uh, on his faith in God and in God's faithfulness to David. So if you've ever been unjustly attacked. You ever been there? If you've ever found yourself under intense duress from unexpected enemies, remember the last time that happened? If you've ever come to the realization uh, that your situation is so horrifically messed up that only God himself could save you, well, then you're going to love what we read here in Psalm 59. <laughs> So grab your Bible, open to Psalm 59. Will you do this? Will you stand with me? I'll read our passage. And as we read God's word, you can follow along. Psalm 59, of course, beginning in verse 1. David writes, Rescue me from my enemies, my God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Rescue me from evildoers and save me from men of bloodshed. Because look, Lord, they set an ambush for me. Powerful men attack me, but not because of any sin or rebellion of mine. For no fault of mine, they run and take up a position. Awake to help me. Take notice. Lord God of armies, you're the God of Israel. Rise up and punish all the nations. Do not show favor to any wicked traitors. <coughs> Selah. They return at evening, snarling like dogs and prowling around the city. Look, they spew from their mouths sharp words from their lips for who they say will hear. But you laugh at them, Lord. You ridicule all the nations. I will keep watch for you, my strength, because God is my stronghold. My faithful God will come to meet me. God will let me look down on my adversaries. Do not kill them, otherwise my people will forget. By your power, make them homeless wanderers and bring them down, Lord, our shield. For the sin of their mouths and the words of their lips, let them be caught in their pride. They utter curses and lies. Consume them in fury. Consume them until they are gone. Then people will know throughout the earth that God rules over Jacob. Sila. And they return at evening, snarling like dogs and prowling around the city. They scavenge for food. They growl if they're not satisfied. But I will sing of your strength and will joyfully proclaim your faithful love in the morning. For you have been a stronghold for me, a refuge in my day of trouble. To you, my strength. I sing praises because God is my stronghold, my faithful God. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I pray that you would, you would put that song in our hearts. God, I pray that in, in the midst of the, the dark situations and the, uh, the overwhelming circumstances and the uh, unsolvable problems of our lives. The God, in the midst of that, you'd put that song in our hearts. God, I pray that you'd put our eyes on Jesus. 
And God, in the midst of this time, you would help us uh, to comprehend, Lord, where it is that we can and we should look in the midst of our troubles, that we would look to you. And in doing so, we would begin to experience your peace even in the midst of the mess. Have your hand on us, Lord. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, as I'm sure you know, most of the Psalms, many of the Psalms were written by King David, and a number of them are labeled as originating from various events recorded in Scripture. Psalm 59 is one of those. Uh, the ascription reads, For the choir director, do not destroy. A miktam of David, when Saul sent agents to watch the house and kill him. Well, we don't know for sure, but we think that probably do not destroy is not an instruction not to rip up the psalm, but rather it, it's the title of a well-known tune according to which uh, this song was to be sung. We're also not entirely sure what a miktam is. Probably it's a, a type of song from that era. But we do know this. Uh, we know that what David writes here is in response to what we read about last time in 1 Samuel chapter 19. There, if you remember, David found himself yet once again under attack uh, from King Saul. Uh, once again, he had narrowly escaped a violent death and slipped away. Uh, but when David returns home to his wife, Saul's daughter, Michael, he discovers that Saul had sent assassins uh, following him home to ambush him there and kill him. His wife, Michael, helps him to escape. And if you remember, he fled to the prophet Samuel, uh, where the Lord protected him from wave after wave of murderous attacks that King Saul continued to launch at him. At some point in the midst of all of that, David composed a song, the psalm, a song that recounts both his desperate situation and his desperate cry to the Lord uh, amidst horrific circumstances, as well as David's bold confidence in the Lord's faithfulness to rescue him. Now, we don't know exactly when David wrote uh, what we read here. It might have been uh, literally in the midst of it all. Or maybe it was after he had taken refuge with Samuel. I think very likely it might have been even later on in his life as he reflected upon his younger days and the things that he had experienced. I think I see aspects of an older King David in what we read here. Uh, he's applying the, the lessons that the Lord taught him when he was young to the cares of a king and to the difficulties of one who is now leading a nation. What David learned as a young man uh, while fleeing from King Saul, he applied uh, to his life and to his living as he moved through the rest of his days. Certainly you and I, as we read through this psalm, as we see David move from utter desperation into quiet confidence and eventually burst into victorious song, we too have the opportunity to learn and we have the possibility of applying the things that we see here to how we live and to what we experience so that we can move from desperation into confidence and finally to worship. Man, I want that, don't you? When I face a bad situation, a really hard circumstance, uh, when I find myself in the midst of a, a health crisis or a financial disaster or a family tragedy, uh, I want to know that I can look to the Lord and that I can have hope uh, beyond whatever, whatever it is that is overwhelming me. I want to know with complete confidence that I can go to the Lord and that he will carry me through. Well, let, let's look at what David wrote. Let, let's get started. David cries out in verse 1, Rescue me from my enemies, my God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Rescue me from evildoers and save me from men of bloodshed because look, Lord, they set an ambush for me. Now, 
And not many of us have literally been in the situation that David found himself in at that point, uh, having narrowly escaped two attempts on his life. And now David is hiding in his own house because there are men waiting outside to ambush and to kill him. I don't think that happened to most of us last week. It's fairly unlikely that it will happen to any of us this next week. Maybe, but probably not. Beyond this extreme experience, though, I think we should consider as well, uh, on top of it all, how overwhelming it must have been for David to know that those who were trying to kill him were his very own king to whom he was loyal and his fellow Israelites with whom he had been fighting in battle side by side. This was truly an undeserved betrayal. It was cold-blooded treachery, and it had to have left David overwhelmed, isolated, and afraid. Here he is all alone against these treacherous attackers. And so in the midst of a very real and present danger, David cries out to God. He asks God to intervene in the the realm of the physical world in the midst of real time. He asks God to rescue him, to protect him, to save him from those who are trying so desperately to kill him. Now, it ought to amaze us. We ought to be flabbergasted. But God actually does that kind of thing. Think about this for a minute. I mean, we're talking about God Almighty. We're talking about the creator of all the vastness of the universe, the one who made everything that exists, the one who existed from all eternity past before time began and who will exist when time has more than run its course. And yet, unthinkably, unexpectedly, maybe even unreasonably, we are told that that God, that omnipotent one, he cares about us. He cares about you and me. He cares about what's going on in our lives and and not just the major crises, but even the minor details. He, He not only involves himself in the stuff of our existence, Uh, But what God's word tells us is that he created us and he created this world in which we live for the express purpose of being involved. Do you realize that? Uh, Did you ever do this? Do you ever cry out to God and feel like you have to apologize? Uh, God, it's me again. I know, I know I'm bugging you again. And, And I know I was complaining about some stuff yesterday, but I've got a real problem now. (laughs) You ever ever feel like maybe God looks at the caller ID and he's like, yeah, I'm letting that go to voicemail. (laughs) I I am done listening to him. You know, she, she is driving me nuts. That's not it. Oh, you might respond that way to me. I might respond that way to you. But that is not how God responds to us. He made you in order that he might know you. He created you so that he could be in relationship with you. That ought to blow your mind. He cares for us. He cares for us so much that he's chosen to redeem us, to rescue us. God wants us to look to him. And not just in the midst of the big crises of life, but he wants to look to us like a sheep looks to its shepherd. And sheep look to their shepherd for everything. We're to look to Jesus, who in John 10, 11, calls himself our good shepherd and who assures us that he loves us so much that he was willing even to lay down his life for us. The Lord wants us to look to him for all that we need. 
and he invites us to do that. that that's, that's what we read in God's word. Hey, I think we should consider the passage that we find in Philippians chapter four. Uh, there in verses six and seven, and I think we should consider it carefully. Uh, we should look at what it actually says here. It, it's there that we read that we are told not to worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. Now, I know you guys don't worry about stuff, but you probably know people who do, right? They're still in that place. They still lose sleep at night. They worry about things that they can't control. This would be a good thing for you to pass on to them. So maybe you should listen to it just for their sake. We are not to worry about anything. Not the little things, not the big things, about nothing. We are not to worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, we are to instead present our requests to God. So God's word says, don't worry, but instead take it all to the Lord. Look to the Lord. And now pay attention, because I, I think we miss this. We read it. But, but then we think it says something other than what it says. What will be the result if we, instead of worrying, take our things to God? Well, he promises that if we do that, then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, now ponder that carefully. It does not say here that if you put in your order with God, that he'll be like Amazon and deliver it to your door. That if he listens carefully to your instructions and does just what you say, uh, that things will turn out exactly like it is that you think that they should turn out. That's not what it says. Uh, rather, what it says is that if you and I will bring our needs our circumstances, our problems, and, and give them to the Lord. If we will put ourselves in his hands, if we will put our hope in God himself, and not put our hope in what we think the solution is, not put our hope in how we think God should fix things, but put our hope in God himself and trust ourselves and our circumstances to him then what will take place? Then we will have God's peace no matter how things turn out. <laughs> Friends, you and I, we can know. We can know that we are in his hands and that he will see us through and that no matter what path he chooses for us, because we don't know what path he will choose for us, I don't know about you, but I know for myself, so often when I pray, I, I'm, I'm telling the Lord, listen, I, I know what I want, Lord, but I really have no clue what you want. I, I don't know what it is that you want to do here. But God, help me to just trust you. I, I, I'll tell you again what I want, just in case you forgot. Uh, but, but, but really, I know what will be best is for me just to trust you. And when I can come to that place, where I really do trust what God chooses more than I trust my analysis of how things should be handled. That's when I begin to experience this pervasive peace of God that is more durable than my plans and that is able to survive when things don't go the way that I think they should go. Well, look at verse three. David, amidst great danger, cries out to God. He says, powerful men attack me. And boy, he was right. No one's more powerful in that day, in that situation, the King Saul himself. But David says, they're attacking me not because of any sin or rebellion of mine. Uh, for no fault of mine, they run and take up a position. Uh, David is making his case to the Lord. He's saying, I haven't done anything. I didn't do anything to deserve this. This isn't my fault. And in this case, David's right. This wasn't his fault. In reality, the reason that David is suffering here 
is because God has made him the newly anointed, though yet not crowned, king of Israel. David is actually suffering because he's doing exactly what God wants, because he is exactly who God wants him to be. Remember all that has taken place. Israel asks God for a king, so God gives him Saul. That doesn't work out well. Saul rebels against God, so God rejects him as king and chooses a new king, and Samuel the prophet anoints him, and that's David. And so now Israel has a king whom God has rejected, and God has a king who Israel has not yet embraced, and that's David. And now Saul, I don't think he yet knows that it is David who will succeed him. And yet he does know that God has chosen someone to replace him. And so paranoid and distrustful Saul, anytime he sees anyone who seems to have the blessing of God upon him as David does, Saul seeks to take him out, to wipe him out. And so David, innocent of any wrongdoing, is suffering greatly. You know, Scripture tells us that you and I as well should not be surprised by unearned enmity. You ever go through life and just all of a sudden find yourself going, dude, what did I do? How did this come on me? I didn't do anything to deserve this. Now, I don't get to say that very often because usually I did something. Uh, but I know for you, it's probably different. And uh, there are times when, uh, when you have no idea why it is that you're experiencing what you're experiencing. And I would just remind you of this, that Jesus was very clear with all of those who would choose to follow him. At uh, John 15, 18, he said this, if the world hates you, understand it hated me before it hated you. Get used to it, Jesus says. This is how it's going to be. John 16, 33, Jesus tells his disciples, you will have suffering in this world. Not maybe, not might, not possibly, you will. And so, as 1 Peter 4, 12 tells us, we should not be surprised when a fiery ordeal comes amongst us to test us. And we shouldn't act as if something unusual were happening to us. Friends, don't be confused or alarmed. Know this, if you represent Christ well, I don't mean be a jerk. If you actually represent him well, you will be treated by this world the way they treated him. That's how it's gonna go. <laughs> Let me mention this too. For those of you who can't relate to being innocent, David was innocent and, and you know, that's great for him, but I think it's good for us to know that God's gracious, merciful intervention is not just for those who have earned it or deserve it. Uh, you and I, we would probably have no chance if God only helped those who were innocent. Amen to that? Yeah. We are saved by grace. We abide by grace. We come into his presence by grace. He he forgives us by grace and cleanses us by grace. By grace, he even transforms us. We start by grace, we live by grace, and if we make it to the end, it will be only because of grace. If you are facing hardship, having done nothing wrong, congratulations. I'd like to hear what that's like. <laughs> Cry out to God. Cry out to God. That's what we read here. But if you are facing difficulty and the honest truth is you had it coming, cry out to God. <laughs> cry out to God. Repent. Ask forgiveness. Submit yourself to God and know because he is gracious and good and merciful, he'll answer you too. And man, am I thankful for that. Well, partway through verse four, listen to what David says. He's speaking to God. He says, awake, wake up, God, and help me. And, and take notice. Notice what's going on here. You're the Lord of armies. You're the God of Israel. Rise up and punish the nations. And don't show favor to any wicked traitors. And then he says, Salah. Here, I, I read this, and I wonder if an older King David 
wrote or maybe amended this song at this point. Here he sees a parallel between that moment of crisis during the days of his youth as Saul was hunting him and what he was experiencing as a, as a king as he led the nation and dealt with other nations. You know, what David writes here, it works in either scenario. He's asking God to intervene on his behalf because he is the God of Israel. He is the power behind the army of Israel. And so David asks God, step in and protect me because I'm God's anointed. Whether he was crowned yet or not yet crowned, he was yet God's anointed king. And so David pleads with God, God, wake up. Notice what's going on in my situation. Now, I find it comforting to know that I'm not the only one who in my dense way of thinking at times becomes confused and begins to wonder if God is paying attention. You know, there are times where I'm like, God, are you napping? What is going on here? Do you know what I'm experiencing this moment? Uh, please be assured, know for certain, he knows. God is never napping. God is never unaware. Uh, remember, as Jesus says in Luke 12, 7, even the hairs of your head are all counted. God knows every detail of your life. Now, we talk about God numbering the hairs of our head, and I know for some of you that's not as big of a number as it used to be. Uh, but what it actually says here is that each hair is numbered. And so not only is he keeping track of the ones you still have, he even has the number of those that have gone their way, migrating to your back or your ears or whatever uh, they do. So was that too much information? I felt like that was just oversharing, but... God knows every detail. There is nothing that has slipped his attention. There's nothing that he is not tracking in regard to you and your situations. And so David says, Selah. That means stop. Think about it. David is saying, take this this truth from God's word and, and marinate your heart and your mind and your soul in it for a minute. Let this soak in because all the things that you're thinking and all the things that you're experiencing, they need to become flavored with this truth. As you go through your days, as you experience the things that you experience, as you come into circumstances and situations that are difficult, you've got to, in the midst of that, you've got to remember he knows. He knows. He's aware. He cares. He loves you. Verse 6, back to those assassins, they return at evening, snarling like dogs and prowling around the city. Look, they spew from their mouths sharp words from their lips for who they say will hear. Those who have come after David, I, I can imagine uh, David uh, peeking through the curtains, getting a glimpse of them out in the dark, uh, maybe even overhearing them as they talk about you know, how they're going to uh, take him out. And they're like a pack of wild dogs, mad with hunger. They're vicious and rabid, and they're spewing arrogant words, boasting how they're going to get David. And they don't care who hears, but God hears. God hears, and their threats make him laugh. Uh, look at verse 8. You laugh at them, Lord. And not because God is making light of David's situation, but because God is no more threatened by them than you are by an angry baby. Remember when, you're, when your kids were really little and, and you'd you know, take the binky away or whatever it was and they would look at you with this look that communicated very clearly, if I had the physical body <laughs> and if I had control over my limbs, I would make you pay <laughs> and pay dearly. 
And yet you can look at that and hold them at arm's length and just kind of giggle. And God looks at these guys. And you have no idea how much more powerful than you that I am, God says. You're no threat to me. You're no threat to my purposes. You're no threat to what I want to do. And so David says, to the Lord, I'm going to keep my eyes on you. I'm going to keep my watch on you. I don't need to look at these dogs. Instead, God, I'm going to look to you, my strength, because you are my stronghold. You're my faithful God who will come to meet me, and God will let me look down on my adversaries. Again, I, I think very possibly an older King David conflates uh, that situation from his youth with the things that he was facing uh, later on in his life on a larger stage. And yet the beautiful thing here is that whether it is young David who is hunted by a few mangy assassins or older King David who is now dealing with the treachery of nations, his God cares. His God cares about his situation. And he cares as much about the problems of the peasant as he does about the problems of the king. And that's good news for us peasants, isn't it? For both peasant and king, God wants to be your strength. Understand this. God does not just want to strengthen you so that you can endure and persevere and come out victorious in and of yourself. And more than God wants to strengthen you, he wants to be your strength. He wants to be the place that you go. He wants to be your fortress, your high tower, your safe place. He wants you to run to him for everything that you need. Consider for a moment what it is that Jesus cries out there in the temple courts in Matthew chapter 11. One of my favorite snippets of, uh, from the life of Jesus there in verses 28 through 30, Jesus cries out in the temple courts and he says this, come to me, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I love that. It's there in that little snippet, we've got this compact uh, version of the gospel message. Uh, Jesus, the Savior, crying out, you who are weary and you are burdened, life is too much, your sin is a it's a load that you can't carry. It's a burden that is too great for you to bear. Jesus says, come to me. Come to me and I'll give you rest. You will find peace and you will find contentment and you will find refreshing when you come to me and I'll take your sin. And you, I want you to take my yoke. Now, he's not talking about an egg yoke. That's the wrong kind of yoke. He's talking about that wooden halter that they would put upon an oxen as it pulls the cart so that that oxen might be guided by, directed by uh, the one who is driving the cart. And so too, this is what Jesus is saying to us is, come to me, bring me your sin. I will pay your sin debt. I will redeem you from condemnation. Come to me and submit yourself to me and you're gonna find that my yoke is easy and my burden is light, that living your life under my direction, receiving from me counsel and wisdom, submitting yourself to what I say, you will find that your life is easier and better and richer. Know this as well. Jesus is not intimidated by our problems. Jesus does not cry out here, come to me, those of you who are a little bit tired and have mediocre burdens. And Jesus doesn't say, hey, listen, I will take the first seven who come my direction. The rest of you are on your own because a man can only bear what a man can bear. No, 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 no. What Jesus cries out is to all. And what he cries out is to all, no matter how great the burden they bear. Jesus is not intimidated by our problems and he is not intimidated by those who are causing them. They, 
they often seem insurmountable to us, don't they? We often become fearful in, in the midst of circumstances that are overwhelming to us. But understand this, there is nothing that Jesus can't handle. There is nothing that Jesus can't handle. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 8, verse 35. He says this, what, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Oh, what can, what can separate us? What can make the, the love of Christ for us null and void? Well, what can overwhelm that? And the answer that is given is this, nothing. There's nothing. There's nothing that can separate the believer from the Savior. There's no enemy. There's no situation. There's no circumstance that Jesus can't handle. Now, what David says next might at least at first strike you as a bit odd. There he says, okay, God, don't kill them. Otherwise, my people will forget. But rather, by your power, make them homeless wanderers. <laughs> don't kill them, God. Just wound them real bad. Make them miserable and bring them down. And then he says, oh, Lord, our shield. Because it sounds way better if you say that afterwards. <laughs> I understand, don't misread what David says here. Uh, David is not asking God to fulfill his own uh, vengeful anger against his enemies, but rather David is looking to the people of God and he's saying, listen, God, you're, you're going to bring judgment on these guys. I know that you're going to bring judgment against them, but what I'm going to ask you to do is to do it in a way that will serve as a lesson for God's people. Uh, like you did with Cain. Remember Cain, Genesis chapter 4, he, he murders his brother. Uh, but instead of ending Cain's life, as God will instruct Noah that that is how this kind of situation is to be dealt with, rather, God sends Cain out as a homeless wanderer to serve as a warning that all might see that there are consequences, that there is judgment that comes against sin. We would all do well to gain the ability to learn from other people's mistakes. Isn't that true? And not only the stuff you see played out in life, you know, you see some knucklehead do some knuckleheaded thing. If you're not a knucklehead, you'll say, that looks like that hurt. I think I won't do that this time, <laughs> right? But we would do well to be able to learn from the things that we read in Scripture as well and say, you know what? God says that'll really hurt if I do that. Maybe I shouldn't do that. And this is what Proverbs 21.11 tells us is that when a mocker is punished, the inexperienced become wiser. So when you see some fool suffering the consequences of their foolishness, the proverb says, you can actually learn that that's a bad idea without actually having to do it yourself. When one teaches a wise man, just shares words, concepts, ideas, he acquires knowledge. In other words, what it's saying is, don't insist on learning everything the hard way. <coughs> well, as we come toward the end of David's song, he asks God to give his attackers justice. Verse 12, he says, for the sin of their mouths and the words of their lips, let them be caught in their pride. They utter curses and lies. Consume them in fury consume them until they are gone. Then people will know throughout the earth that God rules over Jacob, Selah. Sometimes passages like that are hard to read. It's hard to hear uh, someone asking for another person to be consumed until they're gone, to receive full judgment. But understand this. Understand what, what David is saying. He is asking God to bring justice. Something that God has said he is going to do. David pleads that God would bring justice so that everyone will know that there is a day when accountability will come. 
that there is a day when judgment will take place. And we don't like to think about that. We don't like to talk about it, but it's true. It's true. Every evil deed will be punished. Every wrong will be set right. Now, we like that thought, don't we? We like the idea that uh, the one day God has promised us uh, that all things will be made perfect. But think about this logically. In order for that to take place, in order for everything to be made perfect, for everything to be good, truly good, perfectly good, in order for that to be reality, everything that is not good Every single sin, every single single sinful thought, word, and deed must meet up with God's absolutely just and final and full condemnation. The goodness of justice requires the hardness of justice as well. And on that day, On that day, anyone who has not taken shelter in Christ, anyone who has not surrendered themselves to Christ, anyone who has not received the free gift of Jesus taking their place on the cross, paying the debt for their sin in their place, they will themselves have to pay eternally for their own sin without exception. And David says, Selah, stop. Think about that. If you have not put your hope in Christ, if you have not sought his, his mercy and grace, let today be the day that you do that. And if you have, if you have, then reflect on this. That day is coming. And that is why God in his mercy has made us ambassadors to this world. Our God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. This isn't what God wants for anyone. What God wants is for every last one that he created to come to this place of reconciliation through Jesus so that they might be with him for all eternity. That's the father's desire. That's why he has given us this message of hope, this gospel, this good news. And he has called us to go share this to the ends of the earth. Look at verse 14. The assassins return, snarling like dogs. I thought we were done with them. And yet David brings us back right into the moment. They're prowling about the city. They scavenge for food. They growl if they're not satisfied. You think about this. David probably wrote this down. He put pen to paper, I am sure, after the fact, when it was all over. Yet notice that the perspective from which he writes as he describes this is as if he was doing it in the moment, in the thick of it all, in the midst of the darkness and the despair and the fear and the danger. David isn't looking back at what might have happened but didn't happen. Rather, David is describing it all from the perspective of being in the middle of it all and not yet knowing how it's all going to turn out, where it's all going to go, or what is going to happen to him in the end. And it's there, right in the middle of the mess, amidst the growling and the snarling that within his heart, David begins to sing. David begins to sing. But understand, this isn't just a a David distracting himself to keep himself calm. You know, he's not singing a song inside just to keep from freaking out on the outside. Rather, David is beginning to sing a song of victory. David is beginning to sing a song of worship. David does not yet know how things are going to turn out. And yet... Here, he begins to worship, not because he knows that things are going to go the way he wants them to go, but he begins to worship 
because of who his God is. David knows that his God is good. He doesn't know what's going to happen as the night goes on. He is still in the midst of the darkness, and yet he knows his God is good. He knows his God is powerful. He knows his God, it, though it, it baffles human thinking, yet his God loves him, cares for him, knows every detail of his life. David knows that no matter what the morning brings, his God will see him through. And so he sings. Listen to what David sings. I'll sing of your strength. And I will joyfully proclaim in the middle of the night your faithful love in the morning. For you have been over and over again a stronghold for me, a refuge in my day of trouble. To you, my strength, I sing praises. Because God is my stronghold, my faithful God. Let's stand and pray. Father, I ask that you would pour that song into our hearts. God, I pray that in the midst of the circumstances of our life, in the midst of the uh, the irritating little niggling details that drive us nuts, uh, that God, that that we would be singing of how good you are and how you know of every detail. God, I pray that in the midst of our darkest moments, in the, in the midst of our most overwhelmed and, and panicked fears, that God, that song would begin to be sung in our hearts. That God, we would remember that you are good, that you are righteous, you are holy, you are perfect, you are powerful, and you love us. You care for us. And God, you are worthy of our trust that we can put ourselves and our lives, our kids, our, our future, our past, we can put it all in your hands. We can know, Lord, regardless what path you pick from here, it will lead to you, to your grace, to your loving arms, to your kindness, to your tender love. God, may we sing your praises. God, may we sing them not just in the morning, but even in the midst of the night that we might have your peace while we wait for morning to come. Have your hand on us, Lord, we pray it in Jesus' name.